Hello, welcome to the final week of classes. Uh, we've got two videos today, one on the Civil War, one on the Reconstruction period, and then you've also got your final exam for this week too. And because of the, the final exam being this week, I'm going to try and be quick with these for you. So let's start with the Civil War first. And we probably never really looked at a comparison of the two sides, so I put that together for you. The states that join the North versus the states that join the Confederate South. Northern states, huge population advantage. Uh, 20.7 million people to uh, 9.1 million people. And of those 9.1 million people, over 3 million are slaves. The North has a huge advantage in places manufacturing is done. The North has a huge advantage in the number of workers available, the number of railroad miles. The North has a, an advantage in everything. The big question people ask is why did the South think they could win? Well, they were looking at the American Revolution as their inspiration. They're, they think that the American colonies were able to beat a global empire well, maybe we can beat the North as well. Problem is, the North and the South, they shared a border. They shared many commonalities. They shared similar culture, relatives, everything. Where England for Britain versus the colonies, the, Br the British were three months away. So it's not a like-for-like -like comparison. It's, it's not something that look good on paper or anything. As the war is getting closer and closer to beginning, there are questions about how long the war is going to last. Neither the North or the South thought that the war was going to last that long. There were some places who, who thought it would just be a couple of weeks. There were some that thought it would be a couple of months. And there was only two states, I think it was, that called for volunteers to, to last for the entire war. There's a Confederate congressman who claimed that he would drink the blood of all who fell in combat. There's a Northern newspaper editor that claimed the amount of blood that would be spilled would barely fill up a cup. So nobody thinks it's gonna be a long, long war. Uh, both sides though, they have really strong leadership. The, generals who are going to serve in the American Revolution, not, not the American Revolution, but the, the generals who are going to serve in the Civil War, they learned how to fight at West Point, and they got experience during the Mexican-American War. As far as strategy, the South is going to go on the defensive. The South is going to try and protect its borders, but the problem is there are not enough soldiers to make up the entire border protection. The North is gonna go on the offensive. General Winfield Scott, who had been the leader of the Union Army for decades, he comes up with something called the Anaconda Plan, also known as Scott's Great Snake. Uh, he was the commanding general from 1841 all the way to 1851. By the way, if you're curious, he started in the military way back in 1808. So Winfield Scott was pretty old, but his anaconda plan is, is actually brilliant. It had three parts. He was gonna block the ports, he was gonna shut down the Mississippi River, and he was gonna stop all the imports and exports from coming into the South. Now, in reality, the Anaconda plan was going to be a very long, slow plan. It was going to take some time to work. Who are the Confederate States? I've got them listed here along with the date that they joined the Confederacy. You'll notice South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas, they all joined the Confederacy before Lincoln is president. Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, they join after Lincoln is president. But there's your list of the Confederate states. I want you to notice Kentucky 
is not on there, that's because Kentucky was not a Confederate state, no matter what people think. Kentucky actually stayed and remained in the Union the entire time. Now, why was that? Well, Kentucky was officially neutral. And that's because the Kentucky governor and the Kentucky legislature were trying to figure out what to do. Uh, the legislator, legislators were pro-South, the governor was pro-North, and there were two separate militias, a pro-slavery and an anti-slavery militia that formed in Kentucky. Before Kentucky could make a final decision, the Confederacy invaded Kentucky. In Missouri, it's much the same. The legislators were pro-North, the governor was pro-South, and there was fighting there until the Union invaded. And then Maryland, Maryland was occupied by the U.S. Army, and that prevented Maryland from leaving the Union. Now, you might ask, why am I specifically pointing out these three? All three of these were slave states that stayed in the Union. Now we have to create armies, and there really was not an army before the Civil War started. It was just a couple thousand volunteer troops. And this is going to be a question on the final, so make sure you pay attention to this. It's the order in which these armies are created. Uh, the first thing that happened has to happen is people have to decide to fight. And some people are going to join for a cause, whether that be slavery or states' rights or something else. Some people are going to join because they want to preserve the Union. Uh, some are in it for adventure. Some of it are in for travel. Some think that fighting in war is a, a passage into manhood. So after people decide to fight, then you have to do what's called mustering the troops. You have to raise the troops. You have to get those volunteers. And what would very often happen is a prominent citizen in the town or in the county would set up a recruiting office. They would advertise for recruits, either door-to-door, uh, -door, newspapers, word-of-mouth, in church, in social circles. And sometimes people even were paid. Like people were given, is it, would it be award or reward for joining? Either way. Once enough men have enlisted, a company is formed, officers are elected, and then the company passes into state service. So what happens after you've decided to fight and what happens after you've mustered the troops? Then you have to outfit the troops. Early in the war, communities and states together would supply most of the uniforms and gear for the troops. Uh, there was a problem, though, in getting suppliers, and some of those suppliers were corrupt. And then there's a the confusion. Some of the uniforms don't match. For example, there were some Confederate soldiers who showed up wearing blue uniforms, and there were some Union soldiers who show up wearing gray or white uniforms. And as you probably know, those colors didn't match what the standard was. So you've got the troops outfitted, and finally you have to train the troops. After each company is mustered, and once they're outfitted with uniforms and supplies, they go to a state training camp. And that's important because not every state is going to train their soldiers the same way. On top of that, for many of these men, it's their first time away from home, they're going to have a hard time adjusting to the discipline. They don't know how to do the military drill. And that, including, that includes the officers, because remember, the officers were elected. So we create the armies out of thin air by doing this. They, the men decide to join. Then they, they muster. They, they raise the troops. Then they outfit the troops. And then the troops go to the state training camp. Now, the first battle is going to happen July 21st, 1861, at a place called Manassas. And it's about 30 miles to the southwest of Washington, D.C. And the two generals in charge, the Union Army is led by Urban McDowell. The south is 
led by Pierre Gustave Toussaint Beauregard, or PGT Beauregard. And you see here from the numbers, 35,000 to 32,000 soldiers, it was a pretty equal fight, so to speak. People didn't think that the war was going to last very long, so people go and they, they watch this like they were watching a sporting event. And the battle lasts all day. Uh, the Union wins the morning battle, the Confederates win the afternoon battle, and by the time we get into the evening, the Union troops are going to retreat, and they basically run all the way back to Washington, D.C. The North begins to panic once word of this retreat comes out, and when word of the route or the victory, if you will, in the South gets out, people think they have won the war. There are sermons in church that say that the victory was God's will and that the war was won. Some of the battles happen on the water, and a lot of people don't really talk about this. But the first naval matter, battle goes all the way back to November 1861 at Port Royal, South Carolina. Uh, the Union Navy is going to capture Port Royal, South Carolina. That's near Hilton Head Island in Paris Island, if you're curious. And this is going to become the headquarters for the U.S. Arm, Army and the U.S. Navy uh, in the South. After that, in April of 1862, Fort Pulaski, right near Savannah, will be captured. And that pretty much gives the Union Navy control of Savannah, which was probably the second most important port in the South. In April of 1862, New Orleans is captured and the mouth of the Mississippi River is shut down. We also have a very famous battle. You have the USS Monitor versus the CSS Merrimack. And these are two ships that are completely covered in iron plating. These are the precursors to today's battleships. And it's the first time in 1862 that these two all metal all iron ships fight, and they become known as ironclads. Now, the fight will actually end in a draw, but it changes the way the naval warfare is done forever. Uh, for example, the British Navy, which was the most important Navy or the strongest Navy in the world, they had an observer there. This observer saw how the two ironclad ships fought, and when this observer went back to the Queen, Queen Victoria, um, the entire shape of the British Navy changed because no more wooden ships were built and they switched completely to, to ships made out of iron. So the blockade is going to slowly begin to take effect. Uh, Richmond, Charleston, Savannah, Pensacola, and New Orleans are all going to be cut off from the sea. Uh, the only real ports that the South is going to have remaining, Wilmington, North Carolina, and Mobile, Alabama. The war is going to hit Tennessee in the spring of 1862. There's lots of rivers there, and the rivers are really going to favor the attackers. It gives them a way to move around and get to different places in the Now, this is going to happen shortly after the Confederacy has invaded Kentucky. And Tennessee is going to be left poorly defended because of that. So General Grant will use both the Cumberland River and the Tennessee Rivers to get behind the enemy lines, to get behind the Confederate lines. And two forts that protect the city of Nashville will fall to Grant and the Union Army. You've got Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson that fall to the Union. And by February 16th, Nashville was already surrounded 
and the city national was forced to surrender on February 25th of 1862. War's not even one year old and Nashville had surrendered to the Union. Because Nashville has surrendered to the Union, the Confederate troops, they leave Kentucky and they rush back to Tennessee to try and save it. March 17th of 1862 in South Central Tennessee, near a city called Savannah, the Battle of Shiloh occurs. And this is one of the largest battles to, of the 1800s. There are a total of 23,000 casualties that day. 12,000 Union casualties, 11,000 Confederate casualties. Uh, General Albert S. Johnson dies, and he's the highest ranking officer killed in the entire war. And the Union will eventually win. It's a two day battle, and on the second day, the Northern victory is secured because they get overnight reinforcements and the South runs out of supplies. And when it's all said and done, 23,000 casualties, and that is more than the previous three wars the U.S. had fought combined. So this is a very, very deadly day. A lot happening in Virginia in 1862 also. You have uh, General George McClellan, he is going to move soldiers to a place called Fort Monroe off the coast of Norfolk, Virginia. By the time Fort Monroe is fully defended, there are over 110,000 men and 300 cannons ready to attack the city of Richmond. Now the Confederates know that this is happening, and so Generals Joseph E. Johnston and Stonewall Jackson, they also begin massing men in Virginia, and they're able to come up with about 70,000 men. The battle starts on May 31st, 1862. It lasts one month till June 30th of 1862. There's a surprise Confederate attack where General Joe Johnston is injured, and that lets this guy named uh, Robert E. Lee take over the Southern Army. Now, Robert E. Lee, by the way, uh, he is a West Point graduate. He was the second in his class. Uh, he was a military engineer by trade. In fact, it was Robert E. Lee who designed Fort Pulaski in Savannah. He was known for being very aggressive as a fighter. Now, once Robert E. Lee takes over, the attack by George McClellan is stopped. McClellan is forced to retreat back to Fort Monroe. And by the time this month-long battle is over, there are 35,000 plus people wounded or killed. Now, many people will say that the fall of 1862 is the high point of the Confederacy, and that's because this was really the last time the Confederacy was in any position to have a chance to win. One of the big reasons that this is seen as the high point is because the Confederates do not one but two invasions of Union-held territory. Robert E. Lee invades Maryland, while at the same time a guy named General Braxton Bragg is going to invade Kentucky. This was done partially to try and get international recognition. If France and Britain acknowledge the Confederacy and see the Confederates have a chance to win, the thought was they might come in and help. It was also a way to get Maryland to join and get the Union Army out of Tennessee. So these two simultaneously launched offensives uh, happen. Maryland and Kentucky are invaded by the South, but it doesn't really work. And the South is never going to be able to launch these 
coordinating attack again. They're never going to be strong enough. So because of that, because this was their best chance at military victory, this is very often thought of as the high point of the Confederacy. Well, what happens on the political spectrum? Both sides have to finance the war. The South, brand new country. The North, they've been a country for you know, 80 something years at this point. And they handle this financing differently. I mean, for example, in the North, um, they're going to pass something known as the Legal Tender Act, which allows the government to print paper money. And this paper money can be used as cash, and it can be used right away. Uh, this paper money we know better as the American dollar today. And it was significant that that was able to be used. The North was able to keep runaway inflation under control, so the dollar in the Union was fairly safe. The Confederacy, on the other hand, they're worried that they actually are going to start an income tax and raise taxes uh, by August of 1861. There are going to be bonds issued, treasury notes issued, paper money issued. Uh, there's going to be massive inflation. Now, what's really interesting about these Southern treasury notes, it was paper money that could be redeemed two years after the war. So people were expected to buy and trade money that was effectively worthless. And as you can imagine, that caused some issues. Now, one of the biggest goals of the Confederate government was to try and get recognition from English sources and French sources. The thought was if England and France come in and help them fight, that the Confederacy would win. And cotton is what the South thought would be their secret weapon. They knew that cotton it was what was fueling the English textile mills. And so the, South, the Southern government thought if we don't sell cotton to Europe, then they would want that cotton even more and they'd be willing to pay any price. They didn't really think it through though because in the 1850s there was so much cotton grown and there was so much cotton already in Europe that they really didn't need it. So the Confederacy stopped selling cotton to Britain, and Britain says, oh no, anyways, and they just go to their warehouses and pull out the cotton that they bought 10 years before. And by the time Europe finally did need cotton, instead of going to the south, they just went to their colonies. So a cotton industry is set up in India. A cotton industry is set up in Egypt. And southern United States cotton is not needed. So the one chance that the Confederacy had to get this, this diplomatic recognition, they kind of squandered by shutting off the cotton. Once they realized that wasn't going to work, the Confederacy argued that a blockade would hurt European trade and Europe says, you know what, we're selling and buying so much stuff from the Union that we really don't need. What most sides do need, though, by 1862 are new soldiers. Remember, when the war started, both sides thought that the, the war was just going to last for a couple of weeks. Well, by the end of 1861, it's time for new soldiers and the Confederacy is going to pass in April of 1862 a conscription act, which means that people are going to be forcibly conscripted or forcibly drafted into the army. And that's because nobody wants to volunteer for the Confederacy. It's not much better in the Union either. Abraham Lincoln is going to ask governors to call for more volunteers. There aren't very many volunteers, and the union's going to pass a conscription act as well. Big difference is, though, uh, in the North, you could substitute. You could pay somebody to take your place if you were somebody 
who was actually drafted. So the the uh, war ended up being seen as the rich man's war and the poor man's fight. Some political movements in the north. Uh, there's the Copperhead Movement that grew as war casualties mounted. In spring of 1863, a guy named Clement Landingham is going to announce he will run for candidate for governor of Ohio on an anti-war platform. A guy named General Ambrose Burnside, and I highly recommend that you look up Ambrose Burnside on Wikipedia or something, you'll thank me later. But uh, General Ambrose Burnside is going to be appointed the military commander of the region. He's going to arrest Volandiham, try him in military court, find him guilty of sedition, and then send him to the Confederacy. Confederacy has no idea why this guy has been dumped on their doorstep, and the Confederacy is going to send him to Canada. Now, if that's not crazy enough, he's still going to try and run for the governorship of Ohio, while he's living in Canada. A southern political movement uh, in 1862, certain parts of the South begin to oppose the Confederate government. Uh, Eastern Tennessee, Western North Georgia, uh, Western Virginia, did I just say North Georgia? Uh, Western North Carolina, and then Northern Georgia, Northern Alabama. That area right there, so basically the Appalachian Mountains, they're going to turn their back on the Confederacy. And in Tennessee, soldiers are raised to actively fight against the Confederacy, and they join the United States Army. On top of that, those soldiers who are in the Confederacy begin to abandon it. They begin to, to uh, go AWOL, desert, as the losses keep mounting. Now look at the women, too. Uh, women were expected to show their support for the war, uh, but at the same time, they have to remain in their, ex their gender roles that were created for them. So women are supposed to quietly and without any pushback sacrifice their men to the army. They're supposed to help provide equipment and clothing. They're supposed to give spiritual guidance. And they're supposed to give support in morale boosts, uh, these women are supposed to write letters to the men to boost their morale. Now, what do women expect in return? Well, assistance in meeting their, their everyday needs. They expected protection from enemy attacks. And they expected information about their family, information about their friends. And they expected the soldiers on both sides to act honorably. But it didn't happen. Those basic needs weren't always met. And when they weren't met, the women would actively work against the cause. Women would stop supporting the war. Um, they would urge soldiers to desert or not re enlist. They would sabotage attempts to find railway soldiers. And there were food riots, especially in 1860. There were food riots happening. Well, by 1863, the U.S. government is forced to deal with the idea of emancipation, the idea of freeing slaves. And that's because Maryland, Missouri, Louisiana, Arkansas, those places were already either voluntarily giving up slaves or they had been forced to give up slaves after being reconquered. Well, on January 1st, 1863, Abraham Lincoln is going to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. And I'm just going to say that the Emancipation Proclamation doesn't do much probably free the slaves. Most people think the Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves, but in reality it didn't do anything. And I apologize if you are shocked by that. The Emancipation Proclamation, it freed the slaves from areas that were actively rebelling against the United States. And when you read the Emancipation Proclamation, you'll see a little asterisk, and you'll see a bunch of places that are excluded. The reason all those places are excluded is because they were already under the control of the U.S. Army. That meant that the Emancipation Proclamation was written for areas of the South that were not under Southern, 
or that were not under union control. They're unenforceable. The slaves that were freed were not the slaves that Abraham Lincoln had the power to free. So if the Emancipation Proclamation did not free the slaves, what did it actually do? Well, it was a political document that was used to get Lincoln support for re-election. And it was a way to get people to support the war. While the war was always in a roundabout way related to slavery, the Emancipation Proclamation is what put slavery in the bullseye. So from January 1st, 1863, there is no question at all that this war is about slavery. What happens in the late Civil War? Well, Abraham Lincoln, first of all, in 1864, he is re-elected. He wins 55% of the popular vote, 91% of the electoral vote. Jefferson Davis realizes that the war is going to continue and there's nothing that he can do about it. You have the Battle of Vicksburg and you have the Battle of Gettysburg. That happened in 1863. Both of these are important for different reasons. Vicksburg is the only city in the south along the Mississippi River that is still controlled by the southern army. Well, General Ulysses S. Grant is going to surround the city of Vicksburg at, starting in May. The city holds out until July 4th and 35,000 men are surrendered to General F. Grant. This is such a momentous occasion that Grant sends a telegram to Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln very famously says, the father of all waters now runs unvexed to the sea, meaning that the union has complete control of the Mississippi River. Gettysburg is going to happen in Pennsylvania, and it's July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. And both these battles are happening at basically the same time. Robert E. Lee has been invaded Pennsylvania. He's looking for an army that he's told is there. Well, outside the city of Gettysburg is where the Northern Army and the Southern Army finally meet. And it's a three-day battle. Battle day number one is Confederate victory. Robert E. Lee is arguably the better general at this time. But when the first day ends and the second day starts, it turns out that Robert E. Lee doesn't have the best intelligence. Uh, his spies have told him that the Union did not get reinforcements overnight, and Lee makes a plan. The plan is going to be based on the idea that there are not any reinforcements. So, the cavalry of the South is going to fight the Northern infantry. The U.S. positions collapse. The U.S. is forced to retreat to higher ground. But Lee is going to order a general assault on Northern territory, thinking that it's going to be just a cake one. The fighting on day two gets so bad that a place called Cemetery Hill is attacked and the Union Army is forced to use bayonets and hand-to-hand -hand combat to fight off the Confederacy. So day two, it's a defeat because we didn't have the correct intelligence. We didn't know what was really going on. Day three is even worse because the North gets more reinforcements. So their line is stronger. 
And Robert E. Lee orders an assault on the center of the line. He thinks that if his troops can break through the center of the Union Army, that they're going to win. And they almost do get through, but in the end, they're actually just going to be surrounded. By the time this battle is over, and by the time Vicksburg is over, um, the morale of the Southern people and the Southern military is just shot and broken. Lee ends up losing over 26,000 soldiers in three days to casualties of one sort or another. Now we have the Atlanta campaign, and this is going to be a long drawn out series of battles that go from Chattanooga all the way to Atlanta. And you've got General Sherman with over 100,000 soldiers fighting against General Joseph Johnston. He's got 60,000 soldiers. Johnston knows that he can't defeat Sherman, so he's just trying to figure out how do I slow this guy down. Well, Sherman's army and Johnston's army, they're 100% tied to the railroad. That's how both sides are getting their supplies. And if you ever wanted to have an idea of where this battle happens, just drive on Interstate 75 between Atlanta and Chattanooga. At best, the, the battle basically five miles to either side of the interstate. But you got battles in East Ridge, you've got battles Ringgold, Tunnel Hill, Resaca, Rocky Face, and it goes all the way to Kennesaw Mountain. The Confederate government just sees that Johnson is retreating, retreating, retreating. And they actually are going to replace Johnson with a guy named uh, Joseph B. Hood. Hood is in three battles, July 20th, 1864, July 22nd, 1864, and July 28th, 1864. John Bell Hood, I said just earlier, but John Bell Hood, uh, he loses 13,000 men in those three battles. The Union, they've only lost 6,000. In three months of fighting, Joseph E. Johnston didn't lose anywhere close to that number of men. So John Bell Hood is very quickly fired. Joseph E. Johnston is quickly rehired. When it comes time to abandon the city of Atlanta, the Confederates burned Atlanta down. Now you might be saying, wait a minute, that's not what I was told. We well, probably were told differently. But in reality, what happened is the Confederates burned down anything of value. Sherman orders his people into the city and they kind of they don't stop the fires. They don't worry about putting them out because they say, well, let's just let the city burn. From there, Sherman decides to march all the way from the city of Atlanta to the city of Savannah. And his reason for doing this was basically psychological warfare. A very famous saying by William T. Sherman is, war is cruelty and you cannot refine it also known as War is Hell. Um, and so Sherman, he decides to take the war to the people, and he's going to march 285 miles from the city of Atlanta to downtown Savannah. They're going to live off the land. They're going to destroy everything. And it's done in two different parts. Um, Sherman's going to divide his army into two different groups. One group is going to follow I-75 down to Macon. The other group is going to go kind of out towards Decatur and Stone Mountain, all the way to Madison, and then go south to Milledgeville because Milledgeville was the state capital. And eventually these two groups are going to meet outside of the city of Dublin. Then they're going to stretch out a path 60 miles wide and go all the way to Savannah. There is no battle in Savannah. There's a question about which battle was important. Uh, Savannah did not have a battle, so that is not a battle in 1864. 
In fact, the Confederate Army, they abandon Savannah. Sherman takes it in one piece on December 20th and offers the city of Savannah to Abraham Lincoln as a Christmas gift. So when you see a, a question asking which of these was not a battle of 1864, your answer should be Savannah. Savannah was not a battle. So how does the war end? Well, General Lee and General Grant are going to chase each other throughout Virginia. And finally, at the city of Petersburg, you're going to have trench warfare. The city of Richmond is surrounded. Richmond falls to the Union Army, and Lee is finally captured and surrounded near Appomattox Courthouse. And the surrender between Lee and Grant happens on April 9th. Joseph E. Johnston will surrender to William T. Sherman in South Carolina on April 26th, and President Lincoln will be assassinated before the end of the war on April 14th, 1865. All right, one more video to come, and that's on the, the Reconstruction period. And in that video, I'll include a little bit of information on what to expect for 